before lunch discussions and after lunch discussions are always like the two most difficult because everyone before lunch is just starving and wants to eat and afterwards everyone's in food coma. So, you know, I'll try to keep you awake and keep it interesting, but I totally understand if you nod off. I, I won't take it too personal because um, what I'm talking about today um, is not, the, it's not really the sexy part of social media, but it's really, you know, where things are going next and, and things that you need to address and, and get ready for. Um, so what I am talking about, as Jessica said, is transitioning your business from one that is using social media to what I call a social business. Um, and quite frankly, if you're not currently using social media, most of this is going to be totally over your head, irrelevant, and um, I will not be offended if you get up and, <laughs> and sneak out the back door right now because um, this, this really is for people who are using it and, and ready for that next step. Um, so in my opinion, a business moves from using social media to what I call a social business when it adopts a culture of sharing both internally and externally which in turn is beneficial to the stakeholders, employees, and customers. Um, and we'll talk a, lot of, a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but what I want to talk about is sort of that evolution that has got us to this point of social business. Um, we started with um, the evolution is the social customer. You know, these, and what categorizes this phase is word of mouth has shifted from the cocktail party to online. People are sharing referrals, they're sharing information. Um, it's word of mouth is online and being shared with more people. And these conversations at the social customer standpoint are still being, those conversations are being had and the businesses aren't necessarily listening. They, they haven't set up their listening posts, they haven't set up monitor, monitoring, they're just not quite there yet. Um, and, you know, companies are realizing that these conversations are moving at the speed of light. And what I mean about this is, um, uh, it feels like it was three years ago, but I think it was like a month, two months ago, Papa John's had a situation where one of their franchise outlets in New York City, one of their employees, um, on the receipt, I guess to describe the customer, put a very negative racial slur to describe her. Um, when she, and he, here's the really stupid part, then handed her the receipt. Um, so she looked at the receipt, saw that, immediately took a picture with her phone, because we all have cameras on our phones now, and uploaded it to Twitter. Well, it caught wildfire and was all over Twitter. Um, from the beginning to the end of that whole scenario, it was seven hours on a Saturday. Welcome to, <laughs> to communication crisis in the new world. Um, they had, Papa John's had to find out if, you know, if it was a legitimate picture, which store did it, it was a franchise, they had to call, get in hold, a hold of the franchise, see what happened, get that person fired, and then issue a statement of apology and reach out to the customer it happened to. Again, seven hours on a Saturday. Um, it's, it's moving fast. But they were listening and that's why it only took that long. Um, these conversations now have a permanent record. You know, they're online, they're searchable. You, you know, Amanda talked about it earlier. You, you have this thing where they persist there and they can be found. Um, and that's something that needs to be looked at. And these conversations, you know, they're not all negative. They're not all trolls. Some can be neutral or with, when it's content that's shared. And some can be really positive. You can have ambassadors and fans of your brand. So it's not all in the negative sense. Um, a social brand, as we, you know, we're moving over, social brand then starts, and this is the companies that are beginning to listen. They're, they're understanding what's going on, they're listening, they're monitoring, um, they want to be part of these conversations. <laughs> and they're setting up social media outposts. So they're setting up a blog or Facebook or Twitter. They're getting involved. Um, and it's, but still, social media is really being handled by one person, one department. It's, you know, the term that's used a lot, and, and it's, it drives me nuts, but it's the best way to talk about it is it's, it's in a silo. It's one, one group, one department is handling social media. And usually it's handled as a standalone strategy if there's a strategy at all. Um, oftentimes it's just someone put up a Facebook page and they're winging it. Um, 
and it may or may not have the blessing of upper management. A lot of times these things are started sort of as a rogue fan page and we'll do this and then we'll go tell them, see the great results we had. Um, so that's just another sign of being a social brand. It's not bad, it's just that's how <laughs> it happens. Um, the social business phase, again, this is, they're still listening and they're responding. They're being more proactive in getting out there into the conversations. Sort of like Papa John's were. They knew they couldn't let that flame up till Monday. They got in there and responded. And there's more integration into the overall business. You know, it's not just one person in marketing or communications handling it. It's more touch points, and we'll talk about that soon. And the biggest thing is it, this idea of internal sharing and collaboration has to happen. And that's the big thing that really differentiates from a social brand to a social business is those communications are not just external, they're internal. And with that, you're going to need an increased um, governance, which is policy and guidelines and trainings, and we'll talk about that more too. Um, my next slide, I want to take a couple minutes to show you a video from the um, CEO of Burberry. They, she's going to talk about why they have embraced this concept of social business. Um, they call it social enterprise. Um, in the video. And yes, it's an ad for salesforce.com and I will preface that my husband works for him, that's why I found out about the video. But it's by no sense of an endorsement for the product. Um, but it gives you a good view of how what I consider an old school brand in fashion is embracing what's going on. So, um, let's see. All right, where's the mother? The faster we move forward, it becomes even more critical to look back and never forget who we are and never forget where we came from and what made this brand such a great global luxury brand today. I run the company with Christopher Bailey, our chief creative officer. We had a vision and the vision was to be the first company who was fully digital end to end. We are partnering with Salesforce to now take that vision and build this social enterprise. The experience would be that a customer would have total access to Burberry across any device, anywhere, and they would get exactly the same feeling of the brand, feeling of the culture, regardless of where, when, how they were accessing the brand. Everyone now can come into Burberry world and understand the journey and mission that Burberry is on. And to any CEO who's skeptical at all, you have to. You have to create a social enterprise today. You have to be totally connected with everyone who touches your brand. If you don't do that, I, I don't know what your business model is in five years. So the thing when I watched this the first time was that the two things really, really captured my attention. Um, and the one is where she talks about that their goal was to have customers have total access to the, their brand, no matter what medium, and it always to have the same brand, same culture. And we're going to talk uh, in a bit about this, this idea of everyone has to have that same voice and how is that achieved. Um, and also, you know, that you have to create this social enterprise, social business today um, because you have to be connected and if you don't, where's your business going to be in five years? And, you know, you guys are doing social media and you're seeing the results. You can say that about your competition who's not. I mean, where are they going to be? Where are they now? Um, if they're not using social media but you are, you, you have that competitive advantage already. So if you're not transitioning to this next step, over the next few years, you know, again, they, if they're still five, 
<laughs> they're still a few years behind you. They're going to be light years behind you um, as you stop, start adopting this more culture and more um, collaborative culture. So I just think this was really an interesting way to um, sort of show how a brand that we don't really think of as being real progressive and you know, we're still thinking, oh, Fashion Week, runway models, okay. But this is a brand that really sort of gets what's out there and what they can do with it. So let's dive in and talk a little more about what, what's involved. So we have the social business framework, people, technology, and process. Um, I put people on top for a very specific reason. If you don't have your people involved and bought in, you're, you're nowhere. Um, and that's with anything in business. You know, most, most of us who have businesses or have worked for businesses, that's what makes it. You know, it's, it's the people. Even if you manufacture a product, it's still the people manufacturing a product. Um, so you have to put the people up there, and, and that's really going to be the core of what drives your social business. So let's talk about people first. I keep shooting it at the screen like that's going to do anything. Um, what you want to do is start off with a core team. And when I talk about this core team, a lot of times this is going to involve probably namely the person who's been running the stuff from the very beginning. You know, who, who's doing the social media, who's sort of heading that up now. You want them part of the, the core team. And the core team doesn't mean, oh, we go round up all management. No, it doesn't need to be that. It, it can be anyone who has some passion about this, who has the collaborative spirit, has that sort of that wants to share, wants to train, wants to push things through. Um, and it can be and should be across departments. You know, it shouldn't just be marketing people or just customer service. Um, it's about bringing the whole team in. Um, an example is, I guess it was two years ago, I met with a group of um, people from Goucher College. And I walked in the room and I introduced, and everyone was from very, very different departments. And it was awesome because they were there and I was there to talk to them about how to start this kind of thing. You know, how, what kind of policies were gonna, they going to need in place? How were they going to manage these things? And, and it became very clear that that was going to be their core social media team. Um, some people call it the Social Media Center for Ex Excellence. You know, call them whatever. Call them the Justice League for all I care. I don't, you know, do what you need to do to call, call them and, and make them feel important. But they're the ones that are really going to take that strategy you're doing and they're going to push it further. They're going to push it forward throughout the company. Um, they're going to help define the governance. And we're going to talk about the governance issue um, because that's going to really help. It's going to help a lot of the control freaks feel a little better about this whole open collaboration thing um, so that we don't have a Lord of the Flies situation going on in your company. And um, they're also going to talk about the technology and what are those tools that are for measurement or for you know, um, collaborating and so forth. So the core team is who's going to push that from their team out and get everyone involved and everyone up to speed. And a lot of times, you know, this is going to take a culture shift. And the culture shift, while the core team doesn't need to be upper management, this idea of the culture shift needs to have permission from the upper levels. Upper levels need to say, you have our blessing to go knock down silos, do what you need to do to get this working. Um, and that helps create a sense of collaboration and a sense of empowerment on the employees on employee basis so that they are willing to do that. And heck, it doesn't hurt a little bit if you have to incentivize these people a little more, whether it's you know, money, vacation, extra training dollars, you know, whatever it is, that's not gonna hurt either. I mean this is this is a huge shift for most people and it's you know it's gonna be it's gonna take a while. So as you transition, your touch point now to the public or social is mainly through marketing and PR. Um, sales might be using some for, you know, through LinkedIn to find leads or so forth. Um, HR might be doing some recruiting, but it's sort of 
it's not really consistent. Everything's not pulled together. Um, I, I don't know what happened to that. Um, I put a counting on there because I just had a situation where this happened. Um, I was doing some work, and I sent my invoice over, and I had a really good experience with the company until I hear from their accounts payable of this very curt email of, well, we can't pay you until we have your W-9. Oh, okay. Here, I'll send it over. And it really bothered, like, that's my lasting impression with that company was their accounting person because they're a touch point whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not. Um, and that's the point. These are other people who are publicly facing at one point or another. So even if it's not social, it's they're talking to your audience. And, you know, if, if they're talking to your vendors that way, they're talking to your, worse yet, they're talking to your clients that way, um, that can leave a lasting impression. So it's really looking at all these touch points because everyone's talking to the public, whether it's social, phone, email, and that culture of, you know, voice and how we handle these things needs to push forward. You know, I, a great, I'm a big Disney nut, um, I admit it. And um, the thing I like is everyone from the top to the bottom knows how to treat every single person that comes in their door. It doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, what color, what real, it, it doesn't, if you are a guest on their grounds, you are treated like a prince or a princess. And that's just how it is. And, you know, it creates, it's because there's a culture from top to bottom that that's how it's going to be. That's what they say. And there's other companies, you know, that, that you deal with that you can tell that has been adopted. And that's really what's going to win in the long run with clients. They're going to remember that. They're going to talk about it. And there's going to be the winners and the losers. Process. You know, this is where, like I said, this is the, the non-sexy part totally, but this stuff has to be done so that you are working, you don't have issues. Um, governance, your business units setting up their own social media outpost, um, your training, how you're going to handle bringing new employees in, and um, measurement guidelines. So we'll talk a little more about each one here in a minute. So governments. Um, your social media policy, we talked about those, a lot of, talked about that this morning. How many people have a policy? Um, um, social media policy really is your legal document, goes in your handbook, it's often signed by your employees. It really, it really serves as sort of the risk management document for the company to let you know what confidential, you know, you can't put confidential information, you can't do this, you have to put disclaimers. Um, it's really the purpose is to protect the company and it's to give consequences of what happens if you violate that policy. Social media guidelines, it's more of a relaxed document. It's more about, you know, the rules of engagement when you're online, what you should say, what you shouldn't say. Um, I like to call it the please use common sense document. You know, don't go on there and complain about some, you know, another employee. Don't complain about a customer. Um, I actually had that situation five years ago, well, six years ago now, um, when, when who knew you needed a social media policy six years ago? I had a staff member who was writing a personal blog, didn't know about it, um, and I forget how I found it, but he wasn't specifically talking about, he wasn't naming the client, but as soon as I read it, I knew who he was talking about. And if the client ever saw it, she would know exactly who he was talking about. Um, so, you know, we didn't have a policy in place then. We did the next day. Um, but we went to him and said, listen, you, you can't say those things. You can't. And he, you know, he was right out of college. He's like, oh. I'm sorry. Like, he just didn't know. I mean, it was just that matter of fact of, oh, I didn't even think about that. Okay, and he took it right down. It was no big deal. You know, no one found out about it. Um, but that's what I, we run into a lot. And I run into it a lot with a lot of customers where their staff doesn't, they want to do stuff online, whether personal or work-wise, but they don't know what they're allowed to do and not allowed to do. 
Um, and a lot of them are afraid of getting in trouble or getting the company a bad name. So giving, those, giving them those guidelines actually helps them. They're not, it, it's not like a hit on the wrist with a ruler. They want to know where can we help, where, you know, where do we need to stay out of. So that's really where your guidelines are. Um, your response protocol, I don't need to, if you saw Amanda's discussion this morning, I don't need to say much about that. Um, that's really like, how are you going to handle comments, both positive and negative? What's your time frame? Who can respond to them? Um, you know, what, when are you going to respond? What's your policy for comments? Is that posted? You know, that's really how you're dealing with the trolls and the ranters of the interwebs, as we like to call them. Um, and I, I like to have a big, you know, the big sign up, don't feed the trolls. That's all you have to remember. Um, but that needs to be present, and people need to know who can respond to those. Um, you know, you, you don't necessarily want someone who just saw it to be like, oh, I'll go respond to that. They're not, they're not trained. They're not ready to do that. But they should escalate it to the person they know is supposed to handle that. So there, again, needs that collaboration, that communication, so you know who that person is, how to get in touch with them at any time. You know, you don't want to be like, oh, it's Friday night. I'll just wait for this till Monday morning. You can't. You need to get that to the right person to see it and act on it. Um, and believe me, I know that person's not, the person in charge isn't going to be happy at 8 o'clock on a Friday night to get that email, but that's part of it. They know how to react, and it will be taken care of. And then what I have here, I call it the conversation guide. A lot of people call it a social media um, style guide. I don't, because it doesn't, uh, to me, style guides, I'm old school marketing, so style guides to me are the, the documents that tell you how you can use your logo, what colors can be used, what fonts can be used, what, do, you know, what are the palette colors. So to me, the conversation guide is more of defining the voice of the company. Um, do we answer things? Do we respond as I or we? Um, do we use, what's our language? You know, if, does anyone here use MailChimp? Okay, you, I mean, you, you, when you, anything you read from MailChimp, they're so consistent about whether it's a help file, it's an error message, it's, you know, a, a joke. It, it's, everything is very calculated and, and figured out in their voice, in their conversation guide of how they're going to use language. Um, you know, they, they get, no matter who's doing the writing, that it's going to be in that voice, in that image. Um, and it seems like so, such a minute thing, but it's used for the same reason that brand style guides are put out there. If your logo is out there in 10 different ways, it just, it, it starts diminishing the brand. It's not consistent. It's not keeping people thinking positive. Um, if you have 10 people using language in 10 different ways, it's just, it's hard to get that cohesive brand image um, to the user. And, and a bad example, and I won't tell you the company name, and don't worry, they're not here. They're not even local. But I was on their Facebook page, and they're a business-to-business -business organization. So to me, most business-to-business -business organizations, you can, and I'm not saying lose personality, but have fun, but you know what language you're going to use. You're not going to talk like you're a high school kid. You know, that's not your brand, most likely. Um, but I went on there, and I saw that they had responded to a question. It was in all lowercase and had like four exclamation points at the end of the statement, which it didn't even warrant one. And I'm not a grammar police person, and I knew it didn't need an exclamation point. But it sounds so minor, but I immediately was like, oh, why did you do that? It was so, it just seemed so unprofessional. But that person writing it, that's all they knew. They didn't, I mean, they didn't do anything wrong. No one gave them any guidelines of we answer in we, we answer, you know, we don't use exclamation points unless it's someone's birthday. Or, you know, it, and it's, like I said, it sounds really dumb, but it's those little things that start differentiating you and giving you that voice that you really, really need to stay consistent. Um, you know, and, and you can imagine, you, you have an outpost from 
HR and you have an outpost for marketing and they sound totally different, it, it makes it really tough to figure out, you know, what's going on. Um, the other thing that it makes it really hard is so often the community manager for the company, everything is in their voice. Like it's their personality, their voice. When that communi community manager moves on to another company or retires or goes wherever, the voice of the company instantly changes because someone else takes over and they start using theirs. And it makes for a really inconsistent thing because you're like, oh, well, whose voice was that? Was that the company or was that the person? So you need to be careful that you are taking on the voice of the company and not just the voice of whoever's running those accounts. The business units. Uh, I keep referencing Amanda's because her, her thing was so awesome this morning. Um, when business units come to the core team and say, we, we want to we put up a Facebook page, core team needs to say, that's great. We're glad to hear it. Who's going to be community manager? Have they been trained? Are they able to handle community management? Can they respond to things? Um, do they have a content strategy? You know, is or you just want it, or what are you going to do with it? I want to see an editorial calendar. I want to know what you're going to do with it. Um, and then, uh, wow, sorry, my notes got totally screwed up here. And and I didn't. I put these slides in yesterday. At, at noon, I turned them in, and then last night was going through notes, and I realized I forgot something. You also have to say, is it a pr an approved tool, or is it just the new tool they heard on Mashable and said, oh, we want to use it? Like right now, everyone's hot on Pinterest. You know, so does all of a sudden HR run in and go, we want to use Pinterest? Well, we haven't evaluated that as a tool yet f from a company standpoint. What do you want to do with it? Why do you want to do it? You know, that core team needs to really evaluate. Does it make sense, or are you just shiny object syndrome? Um, so you have to see, is it an approved tool? Is it something we have a strategy for? And, and moving forward with that. So your next step is training. Um, and this, again, the core team is usually pretty involved in creating that curriculum of training. And you're going to have different levels of training. Not everyone needs to have a high level of training where they're able to be engaged 24-7 and they need to be responding and they need to be creating content. But everyone needs to know what your guidelines are, what your policies are, and they should have an idea of what your conversation standards are, your conversation guide. And the upper levels, you know, as you move, you might have three levels, four levels. You sort of would define that based on what your needs are. But the highest level, they're going to be your community managers. They're probably actually going to be doing some of the training for the lower level. Um, they're going to need tool-specific training so they understand the etiquette, the semantics of each tool. And so it, it's just going to depend on where they fall in there. And the format for that training, you know, can be conferences like this, it can be internal classroom training, it can be internal um, web-based training or, you know, computer training, whatever it's, and it's probably most likely going to be a combination. You're probably not going to fill a classroom every time you need to do an update on your guidelines. You know, that's probably something you can put in print or on web and people can access it as they want to. But, you know, it's, it's just knowing the, the more people know what they can and cannot do and how to do it, you know, it's just, it's going to be for a better experience for everyone. And in, in addition to the initial training, you know, what, what are you going to do ongoing? You know, how are you going to supplement the training? What if a new tool comes up? What if a new strategy? What if something changes? Um, so there's the, the ongoing training as well. And in addition to your current employees, new hires, you know, is it, does it become part of your orientation plan? Um, you know, I've, when I've worked for big companies in the past, you go in and that first Monday you sit in a room and here's this, here's that. Um, 
you know, does training become part of that or, you know, what is that, that situation? How do you introduce, you know, employees to your culture and your guides and your policies? Um, and it's going to become part of the job description. You know, it, you don't have, very rarely now do you, have, unless you're hiring for a receptionist, but you don't have phone operators. It's just part of your job. You know, when you're hired in marketing, it's expected you know how to pick up a phone and talk on it. Um, I won't go there. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it's part of the job. You see in job descriptions, proficient in Microsoft Office. You know, and, and social media is going to become the same way. Yeah, there, there's still going to be roles for community managers and, you know, people for that core social media team. But it's going to be part of everyone's job as we move forward. Um, and it's going to be something that people need to have some kind of proficiency in it, at least to begin. Um, and again, they, they'll still need trained on the exact way you guys do it and the exact culture. But it's not going to be something that, that sets aside. It's going to be something that's part of everyone's job description in the future, especially with these social business. So next we're going to talk a little bit, very little about measurement, because we could spend like three days talking about measurement. But the core team is going to want to define, you know, what and how you're, me you're, you're measuring. And this is because you need to look at, you know, you want all the stakeholders to agree on what you're being, what you're measuring and how you're going to measure it. Because if there's not that agreement and there's not that consistency, it's just going to, you know, it, it's not, you're not going to be able to measure. It's just going to be something that sits out there. Um, and most likely your metrics are going to be a combination of financial based metrics and non-financial based. And, you know, some of the financial metrics are, you know, ROI, which we're always looking for. Um, what is the value of your content? And that's usually based on impressions. And you want to look at your paid, your earned, and your owned content. <coughs> and your sales cycle metrics. You know, how is social media adding to that sales cycle. And every company has a different sales cycle, and you need to start tying that into it. And non-financial metrics are the ones we're, we're most commonly talking about, is community growth, your engagement, and your sentiment. And like I said, you know, we, you could spend a whole day talking about this, and there's people much more capable of speaking about it than I am. But it's definitely something that, as a social business gets involved, you need to understand that it needs to be defined and consistently measured. So next we're going to talk about technology. And the technology here includes listening, listening tools, um, social CRM, measurement, and collaboration. <coughs> Excuse me. I haven't coughed all day, and now it's going to get me. Um, and a lot of things go into deciding which of these technologies and within it, which vendors you're going to use. And a lot of times it comes down to, you know, number of employees. Not everyone needs a huge system. You know, if, if it's four people in the same room, you guys can collaborate right there. You don't need to have a robust content management, I mean, um, consumer, customer relationship management, sorry. Um, you know, what are your current systems? Are they capable of handling some of the things that you're trying to do? Um, is your IT internal or outsourced? You, believe me, you do not want to do anything technical without talking to your IT department, whether, whether they're outsourced or internal. Don't start that battle off wrong. Um, you know, bring them into the conversation. Make sure they're, someone from there is part of the core team um, so that these decisions are ma being made wisely and not playing catch up and going, well, we have that, or we tried that, no one used it. You know, you need to know what, what's going to work from that. And, you know, ultimately budget. What, what can we afford to put in? What can we afford to implement? Um, you know, you might want a BMW, but right now you can only afford a Honda. So, you know, look at that. Um, and the listening tools, you know, this can be as easy as Google Alerts. And if you guys are not using Google Alerts or some other kind of listening tool, please go home tonight and at least get Google Alerts set up. 
you need to know if you're being mentioned by people and what they're saying and where they're saying it. Oh, two hands shut up. I'll start here. There are, and they cost a lot of money. So you either deal with the pain of Google Alerts, or you pay. You either pay with time or pay with money. With monitoring has been my experience. Because you you can't Google Alerts will give you stuff, but it'll give you a lot. You can't filter out results. You either get everything or nothing. Um, but it's so you can get tools that you can put in search words and then filter out other things. But you're looking at you know five hundred, six hundred dollars a month. So if it's in your budget, it's definitely the way to go. Yes. That's the the first one. Mm-hmm. It won't pick up Twitter, so you need to do a Twitter search. You can do a search on Twitter, use their search tool, and then you can subscribe um, through RSS to, to pull that in. Yeah, it's, I mean, you have to know, you have to start looking up the different search commands and start understanding how, you know, if it's YMCA plus Frederick or, you know, whatever those search commands are that would get you the results you're looking for. But, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of hassle, you know. If you're, I mean, if you're Apple, <laughs> you have to put Apple plus iPod, iPod. You know, you have to, you have to filter that out, and that's where you sort of have to decide if Google Alerts is what's going to work, or if you need to take it up like the next level. There you go. Um, yeah, I mean, so you can you can outsource to a service, you can buy a service. Um, you know, there's other ways, but yeah, Google Google Alerts, you get what you pay for. I will leave it at that. Um, and the social CRM side. Um, oh, if you're looking for some some good um, listening tools, I can recommend um, Sysmos and Radian 6. Um, I used to recommend SM2, but I actually canceled my service with them because they became very inconsistent with results. Um, but you have to, I definitely, the other caveat with a lot of these is you have to get a certain volume of results for it to be worth getting, like, I've done demos with Sysmos, um, and because I don't have enough mentions on a daily basis, we couldn't run the report. So you need to do you need to be your due diligence and demo these things and make sure that they work specifically for you, um, and have reports run and see what it, they look like. Um, social CRM. These are this is what you know. A lot of people use CRM. How many guys are using some kind of CRM within your business? These are just ways that you know you're keeping you're keeping track of who you're talking to, who talked to them, and what was talked about. But now a lot of these vendors are adding ways to connect to their social accounts and you know sort of keep an eye and interact that way. Um, and it's a good way of when the different touch points talk to these people, you can sort of see what was discussed before, um, so you're not totally rehashing the story. You know, nothing drives us all nuts more than you call in especially to like the phone company and you have to tell your story five times as you get passed on. You know, these kind of tools help that because they can pull it up, see what happened and move on. Um, and again, these go from, you know, free to, to money. Um, Sugar CRM is an open source. Um, Nimble is a new player and then the behemoth is Salesforce.
who, even though my husband works there, I find very difficult to use. So don't tell him I said that. Um, and then you, you have measurement tools. And this really depends on what you're measuring. Um, monitoring tools for sentiment. This is where Google Alerts doesn't really work. You can't really, you would have to do all the human interaction of, was well, that a positive st statement? Is that a neutral statement? Um, a lot of these higher end products will give you their sentiment value on comments. Um, so you know what, what people think of you. Um, analytic tools, measuring conversion, traffic, whatever you're measuring there. Um, and then there's social media dashboards such as Argyle Social that, you know, really sort of helps you do some publishing and helps do some measurement. Um, so there are some options out there. And then internal collaboration. This is really, this is where, to me, social business really is the most important. Um, Jessica's looking at me, so am I OK? Um, social business really hits the road where the internal collaboration is happening in my mind. Um, and yeah, we've all dealt with intranets. We all hate intranets. So the idea behind the internal collaboration is to actually create a, have a tool that people want to use, that they're familiar with using. Um, and a lot of those now look like you know Facebook. They look like social networks that people are already used to using and collaborating on. Um, so you want to find those tools that people can collaborate and share information. Um, you know, they have internal tools that do Twitter-like features, so it can be a really quick conversation even while you're on a phone or something. Um, so that's really what you want to look at. And that, those are things like, you know, last year I think I talked in the application area about BuddyPress. Um, there's Yammer. There's Salesforce Chatter. There's a lot more of these tools coming on. But again, if you don't find something user-friendly that people want to use, that whole collaboration thing breaks down. Um, so you want to make it easy to use. You want to make it intuitive for people. So there's a lot to do here. Um, and you know, it's, it sounds big and huge and ugly and hairy. But it just is about starting and moving forward. You can't do this overnight. You're just not going to. But you can start looking at who, who makes sense to put on your core team. Who is already doing it? Who can add to that team from different groups and start pushing this ball forward? Um, and you know, that means really looking at what's the overall social strategy? What are you trying to do? Who are you trying to communicate? And, and what is, you know, what are you moving forward to? Um, and this is starting to create your wish list of tools. You know, what do we need? What do we already have? What would be awesome? And what can we live with? Um, you know, because we all have, have resource issues. And then start your conversation guide. Start your other guidelines and policies and, and just tying that all together. It's all going to start from this core team as well as your curriculum. That's where most of the changes can happen right now. And get that started, get that solidified, and then the pushing out will happen over time. So keep in mind, this is not going to happen overnight unless you guys are like superhero companies. Um, and it's not going to be easy. There's going to be roadblocks. There's going to be pushback from employees. Um, and that's you know, really when you have to look at what's important, who's important, and you know, how far are we going to push people out of their comfort zone, and how are we going to do that. You don't want to alienate anyone. You want them to embrace this. But you know, if it's just over time not right, it's not the best match, you know, that'll, that'll all come out in the wash. Um, the point is, the whole point of this is, is to have happy customers and an empowered staff because the communication and the collaboration is both internal and external now. It's not just pushing out information. So here's a few hundred ways to get in touch with me. Actually, I didn't put them all up there, so. Um, but I don't know what happened to the color either. But, um, Thanks for listening. I hope I didn't overwhelm you guys too much or bore you for that matter. Governance. Now I see, now I can't say it. 
Um, do you guys have any questions? We have plenty of time. <laughs>